Amen. So I wanted to start out with a, uh, just to have you, if, if you have your uh, Bibles to take, just look at something very quickly, because I want to address something. Um, they haven't said it directly to me, but um, just a possible thing that might have come up given what we're looking at. When you tell somebody what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, say something like, well, we're trying to look at people or, or, or trends that might make us unfaithful Christians. You know, things that we would, we've called progressive Christianity or Christianity that's not exactly faithful to the Bible and faithful to the Word. And then you're talking about looking at the essentials, which is the flip side of this, looking at making sure we understand the essentials, and then attempting to rank them. Not to say any doctrine in the Bible is unimportant, but they have a difference in priority based on their proximity to the gospel. But I wanted you to look in the, in the one chapter kind of odd book of Jude very quickly, because I don't, there's a dichotomy we work with. I heard a couple sermons on this years ago, and they're really, really powerful. But here's the dichotomy. Can't y'all just get beyond whatever you're talking about in there and get on to saving souls? Right? You're, you're doing this pharisaical essentials, non-essentials. You're the real Christians versus the non-Christians. What are you going to name names? I don't think that dichotomy is true. So I, if anybody's tried to frame this class in that way, one of the places you could take them is Jude. Okay, listen to what Jude says here, and you can see Jude doesn't think there's a dichotomy here. He doesn't think it's either saving souls and let the Holy Spirit take care of it or understanding the word and understanding doctrine. Dear friends, this is starting in verse 3, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, okay, so I want to write to you. This is an inspired person sitting down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want to write to you about salvation. Then he says this, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. So notice what Jude's doing here. He's not saying it's either saving souls or learning doctrine. He's saying you learn and contend for doctrine if you're going to save souls. Okay, look, notice what he says too after this. Look, verse 4, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So notice, he doesn't just say they deny. It's not like they're not using Jesus' name, <clears throat> but they don't treat Jesus as God among us, as Emmanuel, as Lord. So you see Jude saying there's certain things. If you read the rest of the, uh, of the one chapter, little short book in the New Testament, you see warnings about this sort of thing. They're marked in their private life by uh, a lack of sexual self-control. They're massively greedy. Uh, he, he uses all sorts of analogies for this sort of thing. But notice the big thing here is, is in verse 4. They've slipped in among you. Isn't that interesting? So Jude's saying, listen, it's not you save souls or learn doctrine. It's you learn and, and know doctrine so that you save souls authentically. Okay? It's not one or the other. So I wanted to let you know this is, you could do this with Paul, with John, Almost all the New Testament authors, you can do the same sort of thing. I don't know if you've seen it. I, I was rather shocked years ago when I saw what a theme it is in Paul. He was really quite worried after he would leave an itinerant church plant that they were going to go south. And they'd be corrupted either by Judaizers. It says, really, this is just Judaism 2.0, so you've got to do all the festivals, all the laws, circumcision, all this sort of thing. And he was worried about people that came in and acted like, well, Christianity is a license to do anything. Hello, 1 Corinthians. So you can just do whatever you want. So Paul is worried about this as well. But I wanted to really uh, point this out to you that, that Jude d disallows us from making this dis distinction. That, oh, you're just in there wrangling over doctrine when you should be thinking about saving souls. Jude's like, they're not separate, right? If you're saving souls, you do need to know doctrine. And especially when it comes to what? The most important doctrines we're talking about, which are connected to salvation or the gospel. So I wanted to just bring that... Uh, bring that to you because I think Jude destroys that dichotomy. It's not real. So if we are about saving souls, we will contend and know what we're contending about. Amen. So it's not, it's not a one or the other. And remember, certain people have slipped in among you unnoticed. And now he gives you, here are some hints because they're using Jesus name, but here are some hints, right? The greed, right? Uh, again, a, uh, in their private life, a, a lack of sexual control, um, they, uh, they deny Jesus in their activity, and they, they may use lip service for Jesus, but they deny his lordship. So, uh, again, really, really uh, important things to think about. Um, let's uh, move, if you wouldn't mind, to uh, the, the first slide with Gavin Ortland. I can't remember which number it is, but we'll, uh, we can cut this out a little later. But, but I wanted to bring you that just uh, on the front end here and talk to you a little bit about, about that. So um, 
I also wanted to bring you a possible example of something that we're talking about where you can do what we're talking about in real time and try to determine whether something is essential and where it might rank um, with regard to uh, to essentials versus non-essentials. So um, a couple of months ago, uh, I had a person visit me who I'm very close to, to whom I'm very close. And uh, we actually had our most heated debate over what I felt my friend was turning a non-essential into an essential. So here was the issue. My very, 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 very close friend said, um, I love your church and I really want to go, but your church doesn't honor the Sabbath because you meet on Sunday. Okay. Um, now, he had seen an Amazon special. Now, full stop right there. Amazon special religion, okay? I'm, I'm just going to say, not ripping. I used to tell people this all the time. History Channel's largely good history until they touch any religion, but especially Christianity, um, right? Same thing. Jeff Bezos' Amazon, or if you see something on religion on Netflix. Now, I know you're like, that's a broad brush. No, this is based on years of, have you seen that? Go check it out. Um, just understand that if something is put out on on uh, on one of those platforms, the odds of it being a traditional or faithful to the word are going to be really really low. Okay, just again warning, right? That's true of almost anything online as well. There's you know it's that, what are they? Even the pundits that love the internet say it's seventy thirty, right? Thirty percent good, seventy percent garbage. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the tricks we're trying to do with young people. Is <laughs> they flip that. They think it's like eighty percent great information and twenty percent negative. And I can filter. You don't have a filter anyway. Um, so you don't. You really, y'all know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm saying, right? It's like they're even on right now. So, um, so, so we're gonna look at this. But this is the idea that in the Amazon Prime special, I can't remember the title of it. My wife didn't even watch a little bit of it because somebody suggested it to us. Um, it, it was basically making the claim that you know what's the problem with everything today? You know why it feels like we're in a dystopian age? You know why it feels like everything's falling apart? It's because we don't meet on Saturday. Oh, Seventh Day Adventist had it right after all. Um, so it, it's the, I'm dead serious. This idea of meeting on Sunday rather than Saturday is being presented by some people as an essential and the the fountainhead of all of the issues, all of our issues. Now I, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to be. Oh, well. Paul um, looks at Sabbath observance as something that's that's important, but it's not something required. Uh, now, Christians, most in, in England uh, or that part of Europe, the uh, north uh, western part of Europe, and, and and North American Christians tend to think Sabbath is kind of subsumed on Sunday. We think that's kind of the Lord's day, and. We think it's important to take a day of rest. But remember what Jesus said, right? Uh, Jesus didn't explicitly say, don't have to meet on Saturdays anymore. But he did say the Sabbath is for us, not for God, right? It's not like God's waiting, going, are you going to honor me? You know, are you going to? No, it's humans were made to run in cycles, right? You're supposed to take time to not only get mentally refreshed. Why have, it, why have I been busy this whole week? But also physically refreshed. But generally, since the Protestant Reformation, w we've treated Sabbath as as long as there's some time during the week where there's a refreshing, where you slow off of work, not legalism, but you slow down off work and center yourself and go, why am I doing all this? Mentally, why, what's the p purpose and meaning of all the, all the toil I've done all week? And then physically stopping uh, for a little bit. So um, the early Christians, as you know, met on Sundays. Uh, they didn't have a problem meeting on Sundays. They didn't necessarily link it to Sabbath, um, but that was largely because Jesus resurrected on a Sunday and because they were getting more increasingly disallowed to meet in the in the, uh, uh, the 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 temple, right? They couldn't do that. But if you see in Acts, they were going to the temple. Hey, Alex, they were going to the temple. Um, but as things uh, progressed, you have this idea of, well, okay, we're now meeting in home churches, right? We're having to meet underground. We're getting persecuted. So when the persecution stops with uh, with Constantine uh, after the three twenties, he says, well, listen, this is Sunday is our day of rest. You know, that's when Jesus resurrected. That's our day of rest. That's not. So it's not, uh, you know, th there's there's also even in the history of Judaism. There's a movable Sabbath, right? They, they sometimes because remember when they were uh, uh, oppressed by foreign powers, which was l largely their entire history. Um, they had a movable Sabbath because there's some day they couldn't literally like, you can imagine think of somebody like Daniel trying to pray three times a day under you know three different monarchies, right? Uh, Babylonian monarchy, the Medo-Persian and the Persian monarchy. He he there was there was a strong likelihood he might not have been able to honor the saturday the, f the first of the week so 
I don't think this is treating um, tr this is an essential. So let's look at Gavin Ortland's four um, and and start here. Um, the first is, is Sabbath essential to the gospel? It doesn't seem like it is. It doesn't seem like anybody in the New Testament, I, and especially Paul, connects the Sabbath, you honoring the Sabbath, to the gospel in some sort of direct correlative way. So that's the first way we would kind of look at this and go, is this a first order doctrine? And the fact that Paul didn't think it was something that you had to observe all the time with a type of legalism um, is also important here too. Well, let's look at number two. Where does it stack for under number two? Um, is a doctrine urgent for the health and practice of the church, such as the Christian commonly divide denominationally over them? Okay, this might be a level two because what? Seventh-day Adventists do divide, not necessarily just over Saturday versus Sunday, but uh, I don't know if you knew this. Some of our piano players will actually play at Seventh-day Adventist Church <laughs> on Saturday morning sometimes as well. Um, but uh, this might be one of those. But the whole idea of this friend visiting me and saying that I, I don't know if I can go to church with you on Sunday morning because I really – he he seemed to be pushing it up to our first order doctrine. Maybe not salvation, but I can't worship with you on Sunday because I really am convinced – based on a number of things that, uh, I mean, it got pretty, it got, it got fairly heated. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And, and part of it was, you know, I, I kept telling about the history of the church. I kept telling about the Jews, even under diaspora, when they were dispersed under oppression, how they couldn't always meet on Saturday. And, you know, we had all sorts of discussions about, well, they're there for a reason. God instituted it for a reason. And why wouldn't we move it to Saturday if we could? And I'm like, but it's, it's, even Jesus said that seems like that's getting too technical. Um, again, it's not for God, it's for man. But it might be a level two uh, doctrine like baptism. Baptists emphasize that. Um, but again, I, I'm not even sure I'd put it here. I think the whole idea of putting it forward as something level one or level two. I don't know how urgent meeting on Saturday is for Seventh-day Adventists. I, re I, I mean, it's, it's a point of their denominational divide with us. But they don't really act like that's really important. Really, what they their, their big issue is over what we do with certain prophecies. Number three, doctrines that are important for one branch of theology or another, but not that they should lead to really to separation. Um, I, yeah, I actually don't think uh, we should be divided with, uh, if this was the only thing dividing us and Seventh-day Adventists, I don't think it should be. <laughs> you know, we you can meet on Saturday night if you want to meet, you know. Um, but for, for some of them, this is a denominational distinctive. But I think, for me, the Sabbath observance would probably be a level three. You know, third doesn't mean it's unimportant, but it's not as important as salvation. And I certainly don't know if it's something. I, I don't think it should be something we should divide over. And that, that was the sad part about arguing with my good friend. And then last, unimportant to the gospel witness and ministry collaboration. That just means it doesn't look like it touches ministry. Now, the reason I bring this to you is because this is an example of using our minds to discern certain things. I'll give you another example of something like this. Um, a couple of years ago, I heard a gentleman who's a, a fairly intelligent gentleman say that here's the reason that they were discussing. One of the things that's been heavy on my heart for years is how many young people are flipping out. Uh, leaving the faith as soon as they get out of this community they just go like that um so this was the thing that kind of drove chris and i when we were at uh the the academy up north um but i heard a guy uh, at a conference give an explanation for why 70 to 72 percent of young people even the ones that were first in last out in youth group were flipping by the end of their uh, the middle of their sophomore year to non-belief secular non-belief or a nun i'm not i don't have any religious faith or tradition and this guy said, I'll tell you why it is. It's because people don't believe in young earth creationism anymore. And I said, well, in the q and I was like, well, I've interacted with a lot. I mean, whether I'm a young earth or an older, but I've interacted with a lot of students that have come out of the faith and left. And he said, yeah. And I said, I, I, not one of them over the last decade said, you know what the big deal was when I realized I couldn't trust Genesis anymore. I said, now, if you're going to say I realized there wasn't a God and there were no creator and no Bible, yeah, we're good to go there. But the idea of what the age, how, how old the earth is, was not really the catalyst. He's like, no, it is. It's the thread that unravels a sweater. He'd written an entire book on it. So, again, um, that was somebody elevating a disputable matter in the church up to a point where it was literally the, the, the cause for all this apostasy and turning away uh, with Christians. So uh, I wanted to bring that to you and just, just talk about these things because they, they actually are really important. And whether you, you take Jude seriously or you take 
taking doctrine seriously is a, it's, it's important. Um, and knowing what to divide over and what not to keeps us from becoming Pharisees about it and just putting uh, unnecessary burdens and, ba- and, and boundaries on people. Um, we did uh, Eric Thoanis's, uh eight, and I sent you in the email <laughs> uh, uh, Wayne Grudem's eight as well, but two really, really solid theologians about how we determine whether a doctrine's um, uh, whether it's essential or non-essential or where it falls in the in the hierarchy. We also uh, went over the never dispute crowd last time versus the uh, um, the crowd that says, okay, I'm going to dispute over everything, and we wanted to find a balance in between. All right, um, uh, two things that um, we're going to look at today. Or I'm going to try to get to looking at the the probably the shortest conversion experience in the entire Bible, right, as, as, a, as a springboard for what we're talking about, and that would be the thief on the cross, right? But we need to know, I've, I've continued to return to this, it's important to understand something, that there's a difference between having ideas that work together to make salvation make sense and what you need to believe at the point of salvation. There's a difference between those two. Um, in other words, what you have to affirm to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord versus what you have to not deny later in discipleship that makes sense of this thing, that makes sense of this process. So um, what makes a doctrine essential? It must be connected to our salvation. Uh, The doctrine in question must be, this would be soteriological. That's just from the Greek word soteria, which means uh, save or salvation. Um, The second, it must correspond uh, or undergird the gospel too. So um, we looked at um, 14, you can see some of the essentials here with this, uh, the artwork on, on the PowerPoint, uh, where, you know, this is a, a well-worn analogy where they have two, you know, a divide between Christians or between a human being and God and the cross, uh, bridging the divide. And so there's certain ideas there, um, that were a part of our 14. We went over 14 that makes sense of salvation. So, um, so yeah, at this point in the discuss- discussion, we need to make a distinction. I'm going to say it just one more time. Um, there are 14 critical doctrines that are essential for salvation that should bring a red flag in your mind if they're messed with, if they're denied or somebody uh, tries to change them in some fundamental way from the pulpit in a small group on a video um, that's, that, that are really, really important. But you don't have to go through all 14 to be saved, it looks like. That's interesting. So, uh, and one of the templates we're going to use is we're going to use uh, the, uh, the thief on the cross and try to get there today. Um, but before we get there, let's look at how pro- Protestants and the different denominations divide this. Um, for Protestants, this is everybody after 1519 and Luther saying, we're going to try to reform the church because the church as a big bureaucracy has got some really, really negative things associated with it. For the Protestant, scripture's everything, right? If I, uh, uh, at a Bible, yes, yeah, sola scriptura. There's five solas uh, that are part of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, God alone, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. But think of it this way, if you had to do a visual, the Bible's over me, right? That's the Protestant principle, not me over the Bible. Now you say, well, wait a second, you're reading it and interpreting it. Yes, but at the end of the day, it holds authority over me. The plain sense of the word, as best we can get at it, and the authors in the 66 books with the 40, thereabouts 40 authors over 1,500 years, has an authority over me. Um, I don't find something I don't like and try my best to to get out of it or, uh, or, or to make it very, very confusing. I try to live under it, right? Um, so we're under the authority of the word rather than over the authority. That was a dichotomy that Luther made. Um, so that's one of the things when it comes to uh, the Protestant principle. Next, what about the evangelical principle? Um, so for, for Protestants, it's A, if it's, if it's the plain meaning of Scripture, we sit under it. This would be something that Pastor Betzer was was all about. This is something that I think solid churches that have solid preaching are about. Um, You can normally see if they're under or over the authority of Scripture by how they treat hot-button issues if they ever mention them. If they mention them, if they're saying, well, this is what the Word says, it said this for its, and and this is the way it's been interpreted for 2,000 years, um, then you have a pretty good idea that the person is trying to stay faithful to the Word. Uh, Next is the evangelical principle. Um, So uh, any and all departures... um, uh, aren't all equally problematic. And this is kind of where we're looking at it too. We're evangelicals. That's another word for somewhat the people that believe in the word of God and believe in professing and, and sharing the word of God. We believe that the Great Commission is a commission. It's a command to all Christians to go share. But the idea is that 
the evangelical principle is that, well, there are certain doctrines that are more closely connected to our salvation that are more important, that require more attention. That's what we're doing in this class. That's the evangelical principle. Um, not all of them are equally damning. So, for example, um, the millennium versus faith and works. Your understanding of faith versus works is going to be important far more important than whether you believe we'll experience the millennium at which point the rapture comes and end times. It's far more important that you understand that you're not earning your salvation than knowing when Jesus is going to come back. Okay. I know we all like to know that, but this is an important, this is an example of the evangelical principle. Not everything's as important as salvation. So something like understanding faith and works as best you can should require a little bit more of your attention and time than something like eschatology. Now, that's tough to say here. I don't know if you know that. Um, when you get a largely retiree congregation, most of the time they want to know, am I going to miss any of the fireworks? They really love eschatology, right? It's like, I don't want to miss anything. So is it going to happen before I go, after I go, that sort of thing? Um, now, eschatology, I know <laughs> this is a place where Pastor Betzer and I, I'm trying to think, um, he didn't think it was as difficult as I think it. I, I think it's a very difficult subject uh, because you're dealing with visions and you're having to connect Old and New Testament passages, tie them together. I know what he meant when he said it's easy. He just meant don't disregard Revelation because it's visionary, right? There's stuff in there for us or it wouldn't be in the Bible. But it is, it is difficult. It's difficult linguistically. Uh, I'll just give you one example. As a genre, a book that's a genre, the, the, as, as a piece of literature, Revelation is an apocalyptic piece of literature. But at the beginning, in the first two or three chapters, it's treated like a letter. These are the letters to the seven churches. That's very unique. Most apocalyptic literature is like, here's the future. Here's the future, not put in like a letter format. So it's almost like a hybrid between Paul and Peter's letters to churches and apocalyptic literature. So even the genre is mixed. The language is difficult. So it's, it's, uh, it can be pretty, pretty difficult. Um, another, uh, if, how you understand Jonah's three days in the belly of the fish as a prophetic symbol of Jesus isn't going to be as important as your, your affirmation of the resurrection, right? So again, the evangelical principle says there's going to be certain doctrines that we want clarity on, but some that aren't just aren't as important. Uh, and, it, and it depends on its proximity to salvation. Um, next one, the Eastern Orthodox or Greek principle. The Eastern Orthodox or Greek principle. This is one that says scripture is important, but in 1054 is when there was a ch first major church split. Everybody thinks the major church split was 1519 with, with Luther in, in Germany. The first big split was between, it was over authority and icons <coughs> in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, in this church where the new Rome had come and the seat of power was and what was now, now known as Turkey. And then the, the, where Rome had lost its power and lost its, its, its authority as the capital of the Roman Empire at the time. They were, they, you know, this is the church split over who's got authority and, and, and how to interpret certain scriptural passages. For the Eastern Orthodox, <clears throat> the all the, that all the creeds, all the, all the creeds and all the councils prior to the split are definitive for the essentials. We're going to actually look at four different creeds as, you know, a creed is just a summary statement of the essentials of anything. That would be a creed in any su subject. So, um, but these are the three types. So just to, I'll give you, a, I've got a list here of the first seven councils before the split. Almost all of them are about Jesus. How do we express Jesus' deity without, you know, messing things up and confusing people, especially pagans. So the first one was Nicaea. That was over, you know, whether Jesus was created or eternal. The second was Constantinople, which was the new seat of the Roman Empire. This was over again. How were to, to view Jesus' as Jesus' dual nature? Next one was in Ephesus in 431. This was Nestorianism. Was this is Jesus more like an actor that just dons different is God like more like an actor, he just dons different masks or not? Uh, Chalcedon was four fifty one, that was Eutychianism again over Jesus' dual nature. Uh, Constantinople again, the second one. This is uh, also over Jesus' nature. Uh, and then the last two, Constantinople three, because you can see three different councils, the first seven are in the new seat of power in Rome, uh, in what's now known as Turkey. And then Nicaea two was there too. And those last two, one was over icons, because this is getting closer to the split. And one was over, you know, again, how do we understand and express Trinity? So the Greek Orthodox would say most of this is over how we express our allegiance to God and to Jesus and to the word of God. And those first seven councils and, cre and those, those creeds that came out of those councils are definitive for the Greek Orthodox principle for trying to determine essentials versus non-essentials. The last is the Roman Catholic principle. And they affirm all the councils and all the creeds and scripture and tradition. Now, one of the, my problems with, I, I was raised Roman Catholic, 
with the Roman Catholic position is they treat the history of interpretation as the same as straight interpretation of the Bible. Um, they treat the history of our tradition in the, with the same uh, in the same category in the same seriousness now there's a number of problems i think with that one would be you have a lot of compromised leaders in the history of roman catholicism and the history of christianity prior to the to the eastern orthodox split and then after and then at the 1519 reformation split you have a lot of really compromised leaders that are making pronouncements by way of interpretation that are just wrong um so uh or seem to don't seem to they seem to go beyond scripture so um yeah uh so they would affirm all of it, all the all the councils, all the creeds, all of them. Um, where you know, with uh, Protestants, Evangelicals, and and Greek Orthodox, it's just a it's a little bit different. So, um, uh, any questions at this point about what we've looked at? Um, we're going to look at again the thief on the cross here in a moment. But just talking about the fourteen, and then uh, any issues at all with these different principles for trying to determine these things. I, I want you to notice. There's more similarity here than difference, <laughs> even when you get to the Roman Catholic versus the Protestant principle. Um, there's a lot of things that we affirm with a Roman Catholic, very, very close to, uh, to Roman Catholic theology. I will show you where, where Protestants divided and, and, and Greek Orthodox divided over even less than that. But, um, but any questions at all about, about these principles and about the difference between the ideas and doctrines that make, up, make salvation work? Like build the wall versus experiencing the wall, climbing on it, that, you know, what you have to believe at the moment of salvation. Any questions or comments at all? Oh, yes. Okay, Elizabeth. I knew you'd have one, and you're going to bring up, you're going to bring up. I can. Okay, go ahead. But we'll have everybody hit this, kick this around for a while. So, uh, yeah, hopefully she won't yell it. Okay. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to ask yes. is, um, so Protestants think that sola scriptura. Yes. So if we think that, you know, if somebody else is like, the Bible's trash. Yes. Does that, you know, should we be like, okay, you're not a Christian? If that, happens? yeah, I, I, I the, when people treat the Bible as variable, um, I, I think you'd have to ask some more questions. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, it's one thing to say, I haven't, I didn't get a Bible. I, I'm in, we'll, we'll say, I, I live in, you know, 1946 Russia. I can't get a Bible and I'll get imprisoned if I do. Um, but I believe that Jesus died for my sins. He was God among us, that God loves me and is, is a self-giving. You know, okay, you can't get a, a Bible. I don't think, even without a Bible, I still think you can be saved. You can still affirm those things. Those, we're going to look at the things that you can affirm on the cross. Maybe a missionary came to talk to him. But if you have access to the word, how are you going to know how to follow Jesus if you deny the primacy of the word and we're going to talk about last two fundamental principles that go along with this that are just kind of how we treat the word but i think it's fair to say if somebody has access to the word and treats it like even progressive christians will affirm some of it but if somebody just treats it like it doesn't matter at all then they're deeply confused i mean that's where we get that's the way god speaks to us and gives us uh, access to what he's done right there has to be content you believe in right and that would be true of any of any uh of any anything like if you're a part of a biking club there has to be content there that you're all affirming in some way so um so yeah a follow-up question yeah okay so so then for the roman catholic yes. they have scripture and tradition including right. the history right so do they consider anyone who doesn't think all church history is um essential right. do they think that they're not christian that's another difficult one it depends on what catholic you meet my grandmother tried to evangelize me i left my family left when i was 10 when my dad was in his 30s uh and it wasn't some willy-nilly you know it wasn't just oh, i don't like this it's it's boring my dad had a three-hour conversation with one of the roman catholic priests in in the diocese in north georgia and my mom had been dialoguing with nuns and priests for a while about it um, but my grandmother thought well if, if you're not I may give up all these other things, but we have the communion wafer. And if we have the wafer, that means every two weeks we have to get the regenerate wafer in us to, be, to remain saved. So, I mean, I'm, dead, I'm serious. She'd send me birthday cards and say, Joey, love you. Have, a, have an ice cream on grandma. You know, go get a gift and you'll burn in hell forever. I mean, she put, you'll burn in hell forever at the end. And I'm like, love you. So, I mean, I, okay. I, yeah, I, I, mean, I'm, I, so, I mean, that's unpleasant, but hey, I, I admired her conviction. But uh, I just thought, man, this is, I mean, I've got some of them. It's amazing. I knew nobody believed me. But, uh, but yeah, she, uh, when, when she was really, when my grandfather died, my dad was taking care of her. Half of her eight children, half of them have, have become Protestants. And she tried to evangelize them even when she was getting really, really, you know, up there uh, in her late 70s and early 80s uh, and, and not 
as mobile as she used to be. But she would, I remember my dad would take her to mass and she'd roll up to get the communion wafer and they'd just talked for about two hours about who's the true body and blood. Jesus is the true body and blood, not the wafer that gets transformed. And she'd wheel up and look back in her wheelchair to my dad at the back of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the real body and blood, what I'm taking right now. So uh, she, she, that's what you're not getting. So, I mean, she was really, so there's some Catholics who say, okay, you should honor history and tradition. We should, but they would say you should treat it even more, but you're still a believer. And then there's others saying we're the home team, you're the visitor, and, you know, never the two shall meet. So uh, I will say this. It, when you talk to academic Catholics, um, they really will boil it all down to that, that communion wafer is the thing for them. It's the big one. They'll give up, uh, you know, the Pope's infallibility in certain contexts, geographical contexts. They'll give up, you know, basically honoring Mary too much. They'll give up those sort of things generally, but that's where they'll divide is over the communion. You know, yeah. So any other follow-up? Yeah. Okay, right. so <laughs> now this is where I get um, my blood boiling. Yes. Um, <laughs> where, where tradition in yeah. the Orthodox Church yeah. contradicts Scripture. Right. And they say that if tradition contradicts Scripture, tradition is right. Yeah. Agreed. So, so um, give it, hold on. Now, give an example. Okay. I think she was going to so give an example of this. In the Divine uh, Liturgy yes. of St. John Chrysostom, which yes. is read almost every week yes. at the Orthodox Church. Yeah. Um, now, I would just like to say the majority of this yes. is holy trinity like yes. everything's so honoring yes. and god is so holy yeah. and like they really are so reverent and yeah. respect god and then <laughs> there's a part towards the end that they say every week yeah. and it says it's written by anonymous but it's in the thing that they say every single week okay and you'll get to it I real have quick it. juke is <laughs> juke, jonathan krotov's her husband he's not here this week jonathan comes from a greek orthodox background yeah. um so you guys did y'all go to a service we're going to go to a service around easter or something like that I we didn't went know if, on a on our other week we for sure yeah not week. not okay yeah, yeah. so th they love our church that sort of thing but they're trying to work this out as well and and uh we this, got married in an orthodox church. okay fair enough my, okay my in-laws are orthodox for sure Okay, so it says anonymous to the most holy Theotokos, which yeah. is Mary. God bearer. Okay. Yeah. All holy lady Theotokos, the light of my darkened soul, mm -hmm. my hope and protection, my refuge and consolation yeah. and my joy. Yeah. I thank you that you have made me worthy, though I am unworthy to partake of the pure body and precious blood of your son. But as the one who gave birth to the true light, enlighten the noetic eyes of my heart. You who conceived the source of immortality, give life to me, dead in sin. You who are the compassionately loving mother of the merciful God, have mercy on me and give my heart compunction and contrition, humility in my thoughts and release from my captive thoughts and make me worthy until my final breath to receive without condemnation the sanctification of the pure mysteries for the healing of both soul and body and grant me tears of repentance and confession that I may praise and glorify you all the days of my life for you are blessed and glorified unto ages unto the ages amen okay thank you elizabeth uh, okay, so you guys know Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic have a, a hierarchical view of holiness, correct? That means there is one mediator, Jesus, but you know what? There's a number of mediators between you and him on the ladder up. Part of this is their doctrine of, uh, well, their doctrine of works versus faith. You know, this whole idea of Ephesians 2 versus James 2. We talked about that. Uh, I'll send you links this week for that discussion on Wednesday night uh, that we did in the big house over there in the, in the dome. Um, also, I'm not sure that's from John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means golden-tongued. He, he was one of the most popular and persuasive preachers in the ancient world. Unbelievable. He's just, all this stuff's available online. It's just, you got to admit it. I mean, it's prosy, but very confusing where the language seems to indicate they're replacing Jesus with Mary as the mediator. I mean, that's, a, that's hard to deny based on what Jesus read. Again, I'm not sure that's from Chrysostom. I don't want to believe that, that, that sort of confusion of languages. It's in their liturgy, their normal liturgy. And they normally, you're right. They normally go after it. You're right. I, you're right. All right. 
there's some great stuff in there. So, so here's the thing. Obviously, Protestants would reject that sort of thing because the language is misleading. It does sound like Jesus is really Mary, right? That the worship we should be giving Jesus. And this is an Achilles heel, I think, for Roman Catholics. Uh, on I-24 around Chattanooga, on your way off 75 to Nashville, when you go around uh, Chattanooga, there's a giant church. I think it's one in Florida, too. And it's uh, Our Lady Queen of the Universe. You know, I mean, this is, uh, uh, I'm all about honoring Mary, but geez. So, um, so yeah, I mean, obviously we would, we would uh, reject that. Now, again, if I'm a really um, nuanced, savvy, sophisticated Greek Orthodox, I would say, well, let's talk about holiness there. Let's just talk about holiness that maybe Mary, if she's, if there's intercession amongst all the saints in heaven, she's first among saints and disciples that are dead and gone now, you know, maybe she can make intercession for our holiness. Like, I don't know, that last, those last three sentences, it sounds a lot like someone's getting replaced, right, by Mary. So, um, so yeah, uh, and, and just so you know, um, the honoring of Mary was always something big in the early church, but after there was a relaxation of persecution on Christians, when Constantine comes along and says, no more persecution, and then the emperor that followed him says, I think Theodosius says, well, now I want Christianity to be the official religion of the empire, there were a lot of not, not true Christians, non you know, people that crept in among them, that just kept doing Roman paganism, polytheism, and they just put saints instead of the, like Mars and uh, 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 you know the, in the Greek pantheon, Hercules and um, uh, 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 Ares and Pan and these sort of things. So there were Romans under the Roman aristocracy that wanted to keep on in their in their paganism, but wanted favors from the government uh, that would convert that over. And you see the Mary thing get really accelerated when Christianity, it's a good thing they're not getting persecuted. It's a good thing they have political power and that they're now in a, in a really honored place in the, in, the, in the world superpower at the time. But there's also a downside to that, right? A lot of people that aren't really believers are saying they're Christians. And this is where Mary gets associated with goddesses at this point in the, in the history of our tradition. So um, I would say, obviously, we reject that. Um, again, if you're a sophisticated Greek Orthodox, you'd say that's about holiness, not about salvation. But man, that sounds like salvation. I'm not sure if that's Chrysostom. I don't want to believe it if it is, but it might be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a great, uh, a great example of this. And I think that's something that you'd say, well, this is where we would divide. I'm not, I won't use this kind of language about anybody other than Jesus. Amen? So I think that's, that's entirely fair. All right. Uh, okay, good. We have some time. Um, so um, there's, t there's actually 21 definitive councils for Roman Catholics. Just wanted to let you know. Um, and again, Eastern Orthodox only take the first seven. For Protestants and evangelicals, we just say four creeds. There's four creeds that we look at that are important, and those are the summary documents. None of those four have Mary, even confusing language about Mary. They mention Mary, but they don't, they don't have confusing language uh, about Mary. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, so here's a, a, a quick handy list of what really divides us between Roman Catholics and possibly uh, Greek Orthodox, but um, this, this might be helpful for you. Um, yeah, so worshiping icons, what is that? That's, that's an icon is either a statue or a painting or a picture. The big divide between uh, Eastern Orthodox and Greek Church and the Roman Catholic Church, the East-West Divide in 1054 AD, um, was well after Constantine, was one of the big issues was icons. Can we use art to worship? Now, Protestants say, yeah, you can. You just don't pray to the piece of art. Now, thank God nobody stops at the Jesus statue in our breezeway and takes a knee and prays to the statue, even though it's a reminder of Jesus and it's a great picture of him with children. Amen? But we don't use, we use them as reminders, not as objects. Why? Because the Old Testament says humans are idol-making machines, <laughs> right? We'll tend to put everything into that. Honor very quickly becomes you turning something physical into an idol. Um, B, venerating Mary. Venerating would be putting her on the same level as Jesus or God the Father. Um, we certainly can honor her, but I can, I can tell you this. Most Protestants I meet, um, <laughs> uh, they're so worried about possibly worshiping Mary, they don't say anything. They're like, yeah, great, you know, Mother's Day, Holy Mother, you know. Um, they just stay away from it. It's almost like you meet a lot of Protestants who won't do confession because they think it's going to end up with a priest and a box assigning prayers to get you through the next two weeks. Um, but we should, the Bible's clear, we should be confessing to one another and especially to people that we trust in our lives. Uh, C, praying for the dead. Um, 
we don't do that. Uh, I had a Roman Catholic colleague of mine that was a Spanish teacher at the academy up in North Georgia. And she's like, you know, one of the most sad things about you Protestants is you don't talk to the dead. And I'm like, well, uh, uh, well, we don't pray to them uh, for sure. And sometimes we don't talk to them. She's like, well, that's just, I do all the time. Uh, the purgatory, that's important too, right? Purgatory, that the, this middle place between heaven and hell. And since only the living can pray you out of that, this is something, the place where we depart as Protestants. The necessity of works for salvation. We say works come as a consequence of salvation, right? Um, they come because you're saved, but not, they don't make you saved. Um, the uh, inspiration of the Apocrypha, the 13 extra books of the Bible. We should probably talk about that at some point in the future. The worship of consecrated communion elements, the bodily assumption of Mary, and the infallibility of the Pope. Now, remember, that's, that's again, a highly nuanced thing. They say ex-cathedral, when the Pope is sitting in a certain spot, in a certain geographical spot, in a certain place in the Vatican, his statement is equal to Scripture as God's number one mouthpiece. Number one, remember the hierarchy of mediators, dead and living. Um, we would. That's one of the places where clearly Martin Luther went the other way, clearly. And even it was prefigured in that in the, in the Greek Orthodox. They said you have popes and leaders over in Rome that are saying things contrary to Scripture. And so the Greeks said, no, this is what it means. And the, and the Romans said this. So there's always been an issue of authority. And the infallibility of the Pope is something we would, would, would reject as well. Are there any questions about this list? I mean, I, if you could shelve the ones on Apocrypha, we can talk about that later, but, um, or at least uh, table them for now. Um, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, it's, it's all good. <laughs> but these are the places where we... we uh, we divide now. I didn't put transubstantiation, which is that what they believe happens in the communion ceremony that has to happen at least once a week, or if not every other week. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, realistically, what happens when one pope sitting in the geographical region disagrees with a previous pope that said something That's else? Almost exactly what Martin Luther said when he was disputing his pope as a as a theology. Uh, doctor and and then he went on to say well, what about when councils dispute right different councils y'all from all the councils and when creeds come to different at least different expressions and they just kind of said well we don't know what to say about that um they didn't want to say whatever currently the current pope says because that's just now you're in real trouble right because it could be um so luther just said no no, no. if you're not going to answer let's just do this let's throw it away because it doesn't look scriptural at all you know for you to say the line of popes goes back to peter who jesus put in charge of the jerusalem church um and, uh, the, you know, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Does he mean Peter? Does he mean the statement Peter just said? I believe you're the Messiah. So is it on an idea or is it on the first in this long line of people that have got the keys of the kingdom? So, um, so yeah, they didn't really have a, a, a strong answer to that because um, Luther said you're caught in a dilemma. You either say it's the current pope, which means all the other ones, you don't really believe that because that means at the time when they said it, it went against this other pope. And that makes doctrine flexible or you say we refer to scripture in which case that's what i'm trying to get you to do anyway which means you wouldn't even have an infallible pope if you're referring to scripture because you don't have it in there you may say peter's that but that's not you know that's not at all what it looks like in the in the passage so good question um okay so what are the minimum let's look real quick as we finish up here um remember there's a difference between what you're saying yes to and what you're saying no to uh, I thought this was pretty cool. Off the Babel B. New progressive Bible highlighter, just five shades of white out. So you just <laughs> get rid of the past. You don't want. Sorry, that's not ready. Oh, oh, we went with another one. Sorry. Uh, I, I love this. Oh, we got some more questions. Okay, cool, cool. We'll do this before we get to the thief on the cross. So let's. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Alex, go for it, buddy. Hey, Joe. Um, uh, just very quickly, I'd be very interested in seeing the language of what we believe on the icons. Yes. Um, because um, I really would like to know what they actually believe. Yes. Because um, I don't have a problem with icons. And Neither the reason do I. is the reason is because, and I'll tell you why, because it tells a story, right? So Agreed. So I don't worship an icon. I worship a story behind of, of a person of on the icon. Yes. And to give an example, when I go see the Passion of Christ, and yes. you see the Passion of Christ, exactly. you're worshiping an icon. Yes. You're worshiping Jesus yes. through the movie, right? Yes. yes. So, so I have no problem with icons. But yes. I would be really interested next week if you maybe we can have a language the actual language of what they believe of yes. the icon yes, yes maybe yes. maybe what the people are doing is abusing the teachings i don't know Agreed. i would be interested in knowing Agreed. because my family is eastern orthodox yes. and they do worship the icons yeah. but i would be interested in knowing what the actual theology is what the actual theology is i'll do my best this week great great assignment um uh, i spent a lot of my time this week not only for this but working on sabbath too talking about sabbath but uh um one more thing too i you know I think Greek Orthodox are in the fold. I, I think they're, they're going to heaven. I just, <laughs> it's the same with Roman Catholics. I mean, I'm not foolish enough to say they're all hellbound. I, I, 
you know that's seventy one percent of Christendom, right? I mean, I, I, it's a it's a case by case how they're treating Jesus, case by case, just like they're compromised Protestants and evangelicals as well. Um, <clears throat> but I'm with you. I mean, there's a really rich history of Jesus in paintings. I mean, Pastor Russ showed one last week. You know, a painting of Jesus walking on water, uh, uh, statues, uh, cathedrals, uh, it, it, poetry and prose. I mean, I don't want to. Clearly, we don't want to get rid of that. And because, listen, because Protestants were reacting not only to Roman Catholics, but Eastern Orthodox, we don't do, you know, there are people have a problem with the statue of Jesus in our breezeway. So we kind of stay, it's like that with confession and the Mary stuff, we kind of stay as far away from it as possible because it's at that point of contention. We don't want to manipulate or mutate it or make it bigger than it should be. You know, and we certainly are talking, what are we talking about in here? We don't want to make certain things first things that aren't first things. Go ahead. Um, Joe, would you elaborate on H on that pre previous slide, H, the yeah. bodily assumption of Mary, and then yes. maybe a little more on G? I mean, you kind of hit G there, but maybe H and G. Okay. Can you elaborate yeah, on that? Yeah, the assumption words? of Mary is the idea she went to heaven like Enoch. Uh, or not Enoch, sorry, uh, uh, like Elijah, uh, like, well, we don't have information on Melchizedek, that she also got assumed to heaven, didn't have a natural death. Um, uh, it, it's, again, it's, I mean... <laughs> She was honored, you know, according to church history, she ended up in Ephesus uh, with, with John, one of the most successful churches after the Antiochian church in, in, the, early, in the early church. But yeah, there's no, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's, it's taking that honoring to the next step. And then what was the other one you were asking about? G? Just G, I mean, you kind of hit on it before. But. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the worship of, all right. For Roman Catholics, transubstantiation, transubstantiation, just turned out, just means changing the elements into something else. For them, that is the priest actually changing that, maybe not physically, but essentially into Jesus' body and blood, like the Last Supper again. Uh, hoc est corpus meum, Latin for take, eat, this is my body. They're like, it says it right there. Now, I've never taken Jesus literally there that he meant, I have changed this bread and wine at the Last Supper before my crucifixion into my actual body and blood. I think as the great healer, he could have been a lot more clear. Cut his finger into 12 pieces, handed it to him, they chew it up, he's like, there you go. You know, not, not, that's, let's make it a joke. But, but seriously, I, I just don't see it there. And I've gotten into, again, yelling matches with bright Catholics about, I just, I know this is y'all's big thing, but because that's actually <clears throat> Jesus' body and blood, for example, you have drunkenness happening with priests because they have to finish all the wine. Yeah. So they have a slow Sunday and they've consecrated all this wine. You don't pour out Jesus' body into a sink or into a sewer, right, or his blood, right? You, you eat all the bread, you know, so, it, so it, it, it's a... And so sometimes they'll hold the Eucharist up. That's the Eucharist means the already blessed sac pieces of bread and, and, and wine, the, 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 the wafer or the wine. You hold those things up and people... I don't think they worship him, but man, because they think this actually is in some way spiritually turned into Jesus, it's, you see artwork with just that circular thing with the chi and the row in it, and this, you know what I'm saying? This is the kind of, so, um, so it can turn into, if you're not careful, like Elizabeth, almost like worship of the last, you know, of the, of the elements of the Last Supper because of what you believe about them, and they really do think that's the regenerative aspect of Christianity. This is what gets you regenerated. For a Roman Catholic, they're like, okay, you, can, you can't go without the true body and blood for more than like two weeks. So I'm like, so I used to ask my uncles, so you can't be a Roman Catholic and you can't be a true Christian if you're on a desert island? If there's, I mean, do you, would you become a priest and have to consecrate the coconuts? Or do you understand what I don't understand? So, so I, it seems not only limiting, but I, I'm just not sure that's what we should get out of the word. But Roman Catholics like, look, we've been doing this a long time. We've been out here a long time that we've been doing this quite a while. So, again, this is one of the things that Martin Luther disputed and said, well, the only reason it accelerated is because you guys were most the people that are using the Bible were people that were already involved in the Roman Catholic Church. And that's one of the things that happened after the Reformation. The idea that everybody got a Bible in their own language is huge that you could go and look and see. Do you think this is what idea should come out of what these texts say? Like the Last Supper. It doesn't look like that, yeah. And, and would you say currently all of these doctrines are in place in the Catholic Church? I mean, presently, they haven't gosh. changed, and even though there's a well, uni unity movement. God bless. If you're for the infallibility of the Pope with Francis, <laughs> oh, my love. Yeah. You know, the joke on Roman Catholics is you're having to every week, like, make excuses for Francis. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here, Frankie goes again. It's not like he's high again. I, it's, it, it's, it is, he's easily the least orthodox. He's, he's not... He doesn't have horrors running around the Vatican, 
But I'm telling you, I mean, telling an atheist kid his dad's in heaven, saying we well, need to stop being individuals and just be collectivists because that's more Christian than not. Him, you know, keeping a, you know, a, a, a cross that's a hammer and a sickle with Jesus on the hammer and sickle. I just, I'm like, I, they're constantly having to renegotiate what Francis is saying. Always, 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 always. So he seems like the least the least orthodox of the popes, at least in the recent eras that we've had. He's a long way from Ratzinger, and he's a long way from John Paul, a long way. Go ahead. Len, well, hit it. Just on, on H again. Yes. In our trip to Israel a yes. couple of years ago, I know we visited a church that is supposedly built over the tomb of Mary. So right. I right. don't know how they get around that one. Well, somebody's, somebody's yeah. selling something. Yeah, they're just on. That's just it's an honoring symbol there. She wasn't really buried there. I believe ah, she was buried there. But yes, okay. so that's. Uh, and then, and yeah. then regarding the other one that yes. you were just mentioning about Frank, how often do they let him sit in that? consecrated great where, question you know, don't know i wonder please god there when he's i'm telling you things. i've met devout roman catholics that loved ratzinger but there's a lot of controversy of why he left like something it was over because he realized the the pedophilia scandal is something he couldn't really eradicate and fix and he just said i'm out because most popes go their whole lives and and when they're decrepit they they step away but benedict ratzinger uh pope benedict uh he great pope but he stepped away, and everybody's like, "You left it open for, you know, for Francis or Bergoglio is his real name." But, uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Very quickly, I was just uh, talking to some Catholics last week. Yes. And we're talking about the infallibility of a pope. Yes. Um, and they were telling me, "Well, yeah, Pope Francis, you know, we don't like him very much. <laughs> they all blah, hate blah, him, blah, but." <laughs> He's not really speaking of matters of faith. There you because, go. Because because for them, yes, he's only infallible when he's actually speaking in matters of faith. Right. And 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 I said, okay, so how often does he speak? Uh, do the Pope speak of matters of faith? And I said, only three times in the history. So I said, well, then what's the point of listening to to the Pope right. if he's never speaking right. in matters of faith? You know, he's always talking about doctrines you know? that are th so, two, three, and four. Yeah. So when they make when they make mistakes that they cannot deny, right. that are silly statements. They're silly. like, I'm sorry. At that point, he was not speaking for the Holy Spirit through, you know, in matters of faith. Yes. So we don't really listen to him at that point. Yeah. Only when he's really yeah. speaking in matters of faith. So it's a gray area. Yes. And again, brothers and sisters in Roman Catholic Catholicism, again, I, I got solid, solid people. I've got professor friends that are Roman Catholics at, at Marquette that are awesome. But I will say this. I was just talking a couple of weeks ago myself uh, to a Roman Catholic brother of mine uh, in, in Cape Coral. And I was talking about when he spoke about a matter of faith. Boy comes up, hugs him a couple months ago, remember? Is my daddy in heaven? He did, he's not a believer. I'm not a believer. And he's like, yes, he is. And he looks at the crowd. He's like, isn't he? And everybody's like, e yeah. So, uh, again, you know, it's, uh, you know, anyway. So that, that's one of those things where I just feel, I really do feel bad for Roman. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of controversy over Pope Francis. So, anyway, we can get into that. But I wanted to get this before we got out of here. So, out of the 14, I wanted you to look very quickly at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These eight out of the 14 that at least need to be affirmed implicitly. You may not have to say them out loud for you to understand and be a believer. I think that, that, that and we're going to look at this because they're implied, right? So let's look at this, the, the, uh, the thief on the cross. Doxastic is, again, a Greek word that means belief, right? Belief. What, what belief are you connected to and that affects your actions? Um, the paradigm biblical example for the least you have to believe to be in heaven <laughs> with God is probably the thief on the cross, right? Now, what you don't want to say is this. Well, if we just, all we need is the thief on the cross story. Forget the other books of the Bible. That's just all fluff. No, 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 no. <laughs> there's something about walking this out and understanding it. Um, and there's certainly things that are connected to our salvation, right, that we need of this. But this seems to be the lowest level amount of commitment to get you a, a positive afterlife experience. So let's look at it real quick as we finish here. Um, so if you look in the dialogue, would somebody mind looking that up real quick and we can read out loud? Uh, Aloni, I get the mic and, um, and, and read the, the Luke passage here that has the, the most extensive dialogue here. Um, does anybody mind reading it? Okay. Uh, yeah, go let's let, we'll let Elizabeth. And then um, <clears throat> the crucifixion dialogue here is uh, where we'll end, and we'll talk about it. Go for it. Yeah, so 39 through 43. Very quick. Okay. 
Um, one of the criminals who were hanged railed, again, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Very good. So notice here, we're going to look at a couple of the statements here. Human depravity, that means we are sinful and due for condemnation and judgment. We are punished justly. We're getting what our deeds deserve. So you see there, there's an acknowledgement of a problem, right? I can't do this myself. I don't get an afterlife, a positive afterlife experience myself. One of the, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Don't you fear God? So there's an affirmation, to maybe the two biggest pieces of this, right? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Remember this passage, right? First John 1, 9. So I have a problem. I can't solve it. I depend on God and I need something. Jesus, you are God and you can deliver me to where I need to go and get me what I need, right? So save yourself and us. Aren't you the Messiah? Now he could have meant, look, there's a lot of dispute over this. He could have meant save yourself and us, blast the Romans and start the right end of time. Liberate the Jews, right? What the disciples, how they were confused. But uh, Jesus took this, you know, as an affirmation of personal salvation for sure. So we have one and four right there. Five, this man's done nothing wrong. So there's an affirmation the person hanging next to us is not in heaven right now. So you've got Jesus' divinity and his humanity and done nothing wrong, his sinlessness, and then God's unity, right? That's basically if you're saying Jesus is both God and man, then you've got God's unity there as well, one of those, uh, the eight there. God's grace, I can't do this myself, will you save me, right? The necessity of faith in Christ's atoning death and Christ's bodily resurrection. They're missing, but they're implied because he says, you'll be with me in paradise. This won't be the end, right? You, there'll be another begin. There'll be, you, I, we will extend on death won't defeat either one of us, even though it's right now, it looks like death is defeating us, right? We're, we're beaten, we're bruised, we're on a cross. So uh, though 10 and 11 are missing, they are implied at least, right? That you can save us that you have the, the keys to salvation and that we will extend on beyond this death scenario to a positive scenario that there will be, uh, you have the, the way of defeating death and separation from God and, and, and a hell, hell uh, sentence. Um, so yeah, last thing. So there's a difference, as you can see here, between what you have to believe at the moment of salvation versus what you need to believe to understand salvation, okay? It's a difference be between being, uh, you know, uh, somebody that understands water and somebody in water, right? Or a, a lifeguard versus a swimmer. So, um, uh, you know, learning music and doing music versus music theory. So um, they're all important, but the salvation doctrines of the first things, we've talked about 14. We're going to do two more next week as we finish up. And, uh, and then of those 14 there's about eight that seem to be at least need to be believed in some way in some way at the moment of salvation amen um any question or comment about this because i thought this is probably the lowest level as far as belief uh is concerned lynn uh go ahead and then uh we'll, i'll pray us out sorry i went over a little long today i just want to i did want to get through uh the, the thief on the cross there seems to be an implication that both thieves really didn't know anything about the guy in the middle. Mm. And my contention is, is that the thief that is admonishing the other mm. knew a lot about Jesus. I think yeah. you would have had to have lived under a rock right. to not know who Jesus was in that time. Especially in Jerusalem. Right. Especially during so Sabbath. I Fair think, yes. I, I suspect yes. that thief was probably on his way to becoming a believer. Right. And okay, yes, yeah, so it happened at the last moment as a final thing, but he's the one that was probably recognizing that yes. Yes. this is who this and is. And do you remember there was a transformation of mindset too, right? They were first mocking him together, and then one went the other way. Um, very, very interesting, uh, and, and good reason to believe that. A lot of good reason uh, to believe that as well. Um, but it would have been really difficult too, right? Because a Messiah hanging on a tree, the Old Testament said, cursed is someone <laughs> who's hung up on a tree. That shows that God's cursed them if they're hung up to die on a tree. Um, very difficult, right, to understand. We're all hanging here, <laughs> right? The Messiah doesn't do this. The Messiah's supposed to conquer, but maybe he got that, okay, this conquering is going to happen in a different way. Got that before even Pentecost. So thank you for that. Appreciate it, Len. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Uh, Lord, I ask you to accelerate whatever was true in here. And Lord, help us be not only careful 
uh, with the most important thing that we believe, the most important thing, more important than our marriage, more important than our kids, uh, more, Lord, what we believe about you and how we view you and how we honor you is the most important thing about our lives. And we thank you for this uh, incredible, that we live in this unbelievable time, Lord, and help us not be arrogant and condescending with this, Lord, but help us uh, just uh, be easier understood uh, and to help people uh, on the path, Lord, and help us when we get off the path as well. But, you know, chasten us, Lord, and discipline us so that we can continue to mature in you. So I thank you for this, and thank you for a, a good week coming, Lord. Give uh, us all divine opportunities to share in, uh, in boldness and in love and gentleness and respect. In Jesus' name, amen. 